Hi, everyone. You'll see um, quite a bit of overlap between the general themes of this talk and Paul's talk. Our hope is that this will not be boring, but actually enhance comprehensibility of the topics being covered. Um, my co-author, Pyong Lin, is right here in the second row. Pyong Lin. Um, Pyong Lin and I wanted to start by thanking uh, the National Science Foundation for funding the project that gave birth to all of this work. This Inspire project, these are all the uh, individuals that were primary uh, contributors to that work. And we owe a special debt to Paul Smolensky for all of his inspiration, guidance, and continued contributions to this work. So our talk today is about the discrete and the continuous in cognition. And what we thought would be good is to start off by defining what we actually mean by those terms. So a discrete representation or process is one in which states are drawn from a finite set of types. In terms of representations, you can think about things like phonemes, syntactic categories, labels, and exemplar theory. All these are distinguished by types. In terms of processes, you can think of various types of linguistic processes that involve, say, movement from one position to another. It's not like you're ever halfway between those positions. You're just in one position or another. We can contrast this with continuous representations and processes, the states of which are ones where they can take on any real value within a given range. In terms of representations, these could be things like acoustic or articulatory structure. In terms of processes, we can think about this in, uh, for example, a psycholinguistic model of lexical access. There might be a rapid increase in this continuous value of activation for high frequency words, which enables you to retrieve them more quickly and more accurately. It's our belief, and I think shared by from many of you in this room that there are insights from both of these traditions. And sort of two key insights at a very broad level are one from the discrete tradition to explain the systematicity and productivity of cognition. Theories require the computational properties of discrete combinatorial representations. This is perhaps a controversial claim, but one that we uh, accept. And this is a long tradition in cognitive science reaching back to the phrase structure rules of Chomsky 1957. At the same time, a complete model of cognition must relate cognitive representations and processes to the continuous nature of neurobiological representations and processes. This, too, has a very long tradition in cognitive science, actually stretching back to Rosenblatt's original reports of this, were actually looking at the task of perceptual learning. How do we learn from incoming sensory information? And saying that the way we need to solve that is by linking it back to how the brain accomplishes these processes. So are these insights in incommensurate? And as you might imagine, our answer to this is going to be no. So there's three parts to the talk. The first part, uh, we'll talk about how the discrete computational properties that we need to explain language can arise in a continuous dynamical system. We'll introduce the gradient symbolic or GSC computational framework and talk about how it has structured dynamics that operate over gradient representations. We'll then argue for this dynamical perspective by reviewing evidence about dynamics in linguistic behavior, talking about the co-activation, co-presence of multiple symbolic representations in both language perception and production. And then we'll conclude talking about, of course, the bright future of this work and the insight that it has provided. So we start with, uh, we, what we take as basic is that the brain and um, the mind is realized in the brain. The brain is continuous and dynamic. And so then the main question that arises is how can we explain these computational properties that seem to be inherently tied to the use of discrete representations in grammatical theory? To look at that, what we're going to do is break down the arguments for discreteness into two broad types and talk about how we address each of them in turn. So the first very broad claim in cognitive theory about why we need discreteness is categorization. Dietrich and Markman have a very nice summary of this perspective in this 2003 paper. To quote from that, a system categorizes if it has states that impose classes of sameness on those inputs. Though the inputs themselves differ, the system is unable to discern the difference. So in a purely symbolic computational system, what happens is that there is a continuous inter, uh, in, um, infinity of intermediate states between two categories. Say, between a duh and a tuh sound, there's a continuous range of voice onset times, for example. 
those are then elided by categories. All of those distinctions disappear so that categorization in this purely symbolic framework is equivalent to the process of discretization. So how can we understand this in a gradient system? So in this, we're going to view categories as being basins of attraction. So in a purely symbolic approach, distinctions among intermediate states that are being clustered into categories are simply not able to be represented. The system does not have any means of expressing those states. The gradient approach says that those are possible representational states, but the dynamics of the system drive us into particular points in the space, attractors. These are intermediate, and the intermediate points within each attractor basin are unstable. So they're, not, they're represented, but they are unstable. We'll talk later in the talk about how attractor location and the shapes of basins, of basins might vary across contexts. This is not um, unique to our perspective. This is not a GSC original idea. This is something that has been broadly explored in cognitive science more generally. What we wanted to do is show how this particular insight gets realized inside of the GSC framework. To do this, we'll rely on this simple example where we're going to live in a tiny world where there are only four possible syllables. And acoustic information is going to be coming in. And we have to assign the correct symbolic parse to this incoming acoustic information. So what's shown here is a phonological representational space. So this is an abstract mental space, not a phonetic space. And it's, so it's based on linguistic contrast. So the difference between da and ta, those two phone categories, the difference between e and a, ah, those two phone categories. The four corners of this representational space represent pure symbolic states that represent the pure symbolic parts of this acoustic input. But note that there's also a continuous intermediate state, state that lies in between all of these. So you're not limiting the system to only representing D or T, but you can have blends of multiple symbols at the same time. So how do we get categories to emerge inside of this system? The categories are here in some sense. The symbolic parses are there. How do we ensure that the system actually winds up in those states? So in GSC, as Paul discussed in the previous talk, the processing dynamics aim to maximize the well-formedness or harmony of a state. And there are two main forces that contributed to this harmony value. One is grammatical harmony, which characterizes the structural well-formedness of a state. So here, we're in this sort of simple example of speech perception, the harmony is saying that if you receive an acoustic input that is the sound ta, you should activate syllable parses that have the phone ta inside of them. We're going to be talking about speech perception, so the input is actually going to unfold incrementally. So we're going to present the network first with ta and then with e, and that will be, should ideally yield uh, the perception of a t syllable parse. The second main contribution that Paul mentioned as well is quantization harmony. This harmony measure refers to how close a given representational state is to a pure symbolic state. Initially in computation, this is going to make a weak contribution to total harmony. Its a contribution will then increase over the course of computation. So one way to think about this, perhaps intuitively, is that it's a measure of how much the system is committing to a particular response option. So initially, it's not very committed, and then it moves to a very committed state. So I'm going to illustrate this using a uh, little movie showing the dynamics of this system. The bottom of this figure here is the representational space I, I showed you two slides ago. So we have the x1 dimension representing the distinction between da versus ta, and the x2 dimension representing the distinction between e versus a. Ah. The y-axis here is a depiction of the harmony surface. So how well formed are all of the states within this two-dimensional space? The green dot you see, which is located both at the top of the harmony surface and then also inside uh, the representational space at the bottom, is showing you the particular computational state that the system is in at any given point in processing. So the system is initialized near the uh, center of the representational space. And then we present the network with the input ta for some period of time. Oh, ah. we'll there we go. 
So during the initial phases of computation, we're presenting ta, and what you can see is the harmony surface has tilted. So now syllables that have ta properties, being at this side of the um, uh, space, are favored relative to ones on the duh side of the representational space. And you can see the green dot has sort of tracked that as it's trying to maximize harmony. When we now introduce E, we get a distortion of the, the representational, the harmony surface shifts to reflect the new acoustic input. So that states closer to the E side of the representational space are favored relative to those on the A side of the representational space. Now during all of this processing, quantization has been getting stronger. And what you'll see in the final phases here is that as quantization becomes stronger, the middle of this representational space lowers in harmony, progressively lowering and lowering only until the, the corners of the representational space are assigned high harmony. And then the, the processing terminates at this uh, symbolic parse. So just to show you the movie again, first we're tilting towards the ta side of the continuum, then towards the e side of the continuum, and then quantization is growing <coughs> strong to favor these pure symbolic states. Another way to look at this final point in computation is in terms of a vector field. And this, I think, really helps to illustrate this concept of basins of attraction. So at the final stages of computation, when quantization is very strong, the intermediate states have, if you can see these little arrows in the center here, the intermediate states are unstable. They will flow away from the center towards one of these four corners. So these Attractor states that lie on each side are the stable points. So the categorization is occurring because of the dynamics of the system being driven towards these particular attractor points. So this is how we can have categories inside of a continuous dynamical system. The second major claim that we think underlies the argument for discreteness is generativity. Now, I like to talk about, give you some examples here from articulatory phonology, which is not a theoretical framework you tend to associate with discrete symbolic representations. But there are, in fact, gestural components that are discrete inside of that system. This comes from this work of Adler back in the late 80s, where he talked about the particulate principle of self-diversifying systems. Self-diversifying is, is the word for generativity inside of this system. So Studer Kennedy, talking about this, describes it as discrete particles or elements drawn from a finite set of types, I would add, are repeatedly permuted and combined to yield larger units, higher in a hierarchy and more diverse in structure and function. So this holds even at, even in linguistic representational frameworks that are very close to the physical uh, realization of speech, we still talk about discrete elements as being necessary to explain generativity. And of course, these arguments apply in spades at higher levels of linguistic structure. So how is it that this occurs inside of a discrete, uh, gradient system? So in the discrete approach, we define rules or processes for recombining discrete elements into novel structures. In the gradient approach, the dynamics of the system is itself combinatorially structured. So complex attractors are not independently defined. They are defined in terms of recombining more simpler attractors into these complex attractors. Again, this is not unique to GSC. This has been pursued in other types of connectionist um, uh, frameworks. But let me uh, discuss it in the context of GSC. So here again is our graph showing just the simple da, ta, a, e uh, space. There are four attractors inside of this, these four stable points. These four attractors actually arise from simpler attractors. So along the x1 dimension, we have two attractor states characterizing the duh versus ta contrast. Along the x2 dimension, we have two attractors characterizing the a versus e contrast. Those simpler attractors recombined to define the four possible attractors that are the syllable parses inside of this system. We'll need additional elements to represent the binding of these elements uh, together into, into, into syllables, but the existence of these complex attractor states comes from these more simpler attractors. Paul talked a little bit more about tensor products being a highly expressive formalism, so I won't return to that, but this type of approach can be generalized to much more complex uh, representational structures. 
So what I'd like you to take away from this is that the qualities of discreteness that we think of as being so critical for explaining cognition don't reflect limitations on the representational structure of the cognitive system, but rather restrictions on the structure of the dynamics of the system. So discrete categories are functionally relevant to cognition, but not relevant at the level of processing within the system. One final point that I think is really key here is whenever we talk about this, it's very easy, especially if we're using phonological examples, to fall back on the idea that, oh, this is represented like the duh, tuh contrast is VOT, or some other type of measure. That is an analog representation, where gradients, the gradients in the cognitive representation has a direct or analogous relationship to a physical property, energy in the signal at some frequency, the degree of articulatory constriction, VOT, a non-analog representation, which is what we're focusing on here, is a case where gradients is related to a property of mental representations. The paradigmatic example being activation. You can think of this as the extent to which a given representation is dominating planning and production, or in perception, the extent to which a given representation is the focus of the perceiver's attention. Key here is that once we separate gradients from physical dimensions, can start to see how gradients being an abstract mental property is not limited to representations that have a close representation to the signal, but hold at much more abstract levels of representation. So we can have gradients in terms of which words are represented or which syntactic structures are represented, et cetera. So in the first part of the talk, I've been arguing about how actually this, even though it's continuous and dis, uh, gradient, it actually has lots of discrete properties. You might be thinking, well, if discreteness is so great, why are we actually talking about gradients at all? Why talk about that? So here in the next part, what we wanted to do is provide evidence in favor of dynamics in linguistic behavior. So the corners of the representational space correspond to discrete symbolic states, but the remainder of the space in this simple case are blends of multiple symbol structures. So points here are, for example, a blend of D and DA, both co-present within the system at the same time. So this predicts that in early stages of computa computation, when quantization is weak, we should see strong blends in processing. We should also observe weak blends where we're close but not identical to a pure symbolic state at later stages of computation. So we will converge to an attractor state that is near but not identical to a pure symbolic state. So in this section, we'll discuss first the early stages and then second the later stages of computation. The first uh, result we want to build on here is this classic result from Al Alapena and colleagues. So in this study, participants uh, looked at a display, such as the one shown in the lower left, they would fixate on the gray dot. They then heard a spoken instruction, click on the sandal. They moved their mouse and clicked on the picture of the sandal, which is what is supposed to be depicted in the lower right of that figure. And key is that they tracked individuals' eye movements across many different trials, enabling them to look at where what people were looking at at various points in time. They cleverly constructed these displays such that there was a competitor that overlapped at the beginning of the target, so for example, sandwich for sandal, as well as a competitor that overlapped at the end of the target, so candle for sandal, as well as an unrelated baseline item. The eye movements are shown here in this graph on the right, sort of a, a, a idealized version of this. So what Alapen et al. noted is that as the acoustic signal unfolds, there are looks to all words that share acoustic properties with the signal. So during initial phases, you're looking at both sandwich and sandal. Later on, you look at both candle and sandal, as you can see by the purple line being sli slightly higher than the unrelated baseline. So we take this to be co-activation, the simultaneous presence of multiple different cognitive representations. The system, though, doesn't hang inside of this um, blended state, it later in processing, it converges to a target form, which we call, refer to as selection. So how does this pattern emerge in GSC? What I'm going to do is just, what we're going to do is present a very simple model of lexical access. So in this process, um, we're going to be mapping from a sequence of segments, so su, ad, na, to a binding of those segments to a lexical item, sandal. 
And to make our lives easier, we're just going to have two segments inside of this. So a segment being the beginning of the target, and then a segment referring to the end of the target. We'll then have four possible uh, competitors here. One is a cohort that overlaps the beginning. So our target is AB. This will be AC, so it'll differ in the offset. A rhyme competitor that will overlap at the end, but not the beginning. So it has B, but then D in initial position. And then an unrelated competitor that overlaps in neither. Grammatical harmony in this process is going to be a little bit similar to the previous example, favoring the activation of representational of representations of lexical items that share structure with the incremental input. So when the A, a symbol is presented, you should activate all lexical items that uh, have the A representation. Quantization harmony will then favor activation of a single lexical item. So what do we see in this type of system? So the uh, display is shown again on the left. On the right is the activation of uh, the normalized activation of these uh, various uh, representations. And so we interpret that as kind of relative probability of looking at the various uh, represent, uh, lexical items. The vertical line shows you the division between when the initial segment was presented and the final segment was presented. Here we assume a kind of uh, categorical move, but you could, uh, this is not an inherent limitation to the system. There could be a more gradual transition between the two. So when quantization is relatively low during the initial segment and the initial parts of the final segment, GSC system is in a blend state. It's activating multiple different lexical items as they share um, structure with the input that's being presented. So you can see not only sandwich, the one overlapping with the beginning of the target, and orange is active, but also candle that overlaps at the end of the target. Later in processing, quantization is strong, and the system converges to something approximating a discrete state that represents the target form. So this, of course, is not something that GSC is needed to account for. This is something that's been accounted for by many other dynamical systems frameworks, including, most famously, the trace model of speech perception. In the next part, we want to talk about something that is more unique to GSC, which is the ability to combine grammatical analyses with gradient um, processing. And to do this, we'll talk about an empirical phenomena referred to as final devoicing. This is a very common cross-linguistic process where a laryngeal contrast, an obstruence, is suspended in what I'll refer to as final position. I'll return to that in a second. So here's an example in German where if you see the inflected, we have um, stems that differ in terms of whether there's a voiced segment D or a voiceless segment T at the end of the stem. We know there is this distinction because if we looked at inflected forms where they're not occurring in final position, as shown on the right examples, we see a contrast in the uh, uh, voicing of these uh, two different forms. If you then look at when the stems are pronounced in isolation, there isn't a contrast. So both are realized with a voiceless counterpart. So there's in the final position, we get devoicing. Now, this is clearly a grammatical phenomenon. It's not a passive phonetic effect, because we have that in English. It, in German, it's something that's applied much more systematically. Importantly, though, it also varies across different contexts. Depending on who you talk to, these have something to do with the morphological context in which the segment is occurring, or it could be the prosodic context that's occur that is driving this. But the main point across all of these analyses is if you really want to specify what final is, you have to make reference to linguistic structure. And that means we need to avail ourselves of the descriptive machinery that linguistic theory provides us. Even though it's a grammatical phenomenon because of this, though, it is not discrete. So it is phonetically incomplete. There's a weak distinction between obstruents in their primary acoustic cue to voicing, vowel length. So in the devoicing context, Vowels preceding the underlyingly voiced stops. So, for example, wheel shown at the uh, top here, have about they're about 10 milliseconds longer. Their vowels relative to the voiceless stops. This has been recently confirmed by a really impressive meta-analysis by uh, Nissen Boyman colleagues. The diff now it's not that this there is this phonetic distinction, but it is clearly a lot smaller than in a full realization. It's less than a third of the vowel duration difference that you get in the inflected context, and it's really near to the limits of perceptibility. So we have this interesting contradiction where we are getting neutralization, but it also has this gradient 
component to it. How can we explain both of these? So in our analysis, um, we're going to make use of simplified representations where we have the voicing contrast and obstruents. And we're going to simplify the phonological context to um, just be coda to represent final position and onset to represent non-final position. We'll have four, set, four constraints here, um, which will assign harmony not only to the symbolic states, but all of the intermediate states in between them. So the final devoicing constraint will have a weight of negative one, and its violation will be assessed by the product of the activation of the voiced feature and the coda feature. We will also have a faithfulness constraint ident voicing that will assign violations at negative 0.5 by the activation of the incorrect voicing feature. You can see this is weaker, so we expect the final devoicing constraint to dominate processing. We also include some faithfulness constraints to make sure that we don't avoid final devoicing by moving it into an onset position. Here, um, what I'm showing here is the lower half of the activation space for voiced encoda on the uh, x-axis. On the y-axis is the upper half of the activation space for voiceless encoda. The, what's shown here is the harmony. The color represents the harmony, so warm means more harmonic. And the red x shows you the most harmonic point in uh, each space. So what you can see is, either voiced or voiceless input, you're going to be in the upper left-hand corner. High activation of voiceless encoda, low activation of voiced encoda. Now to talk about gradients, let's zoom in on this um, corner of the space. So here we're looking at the upper 2% of voiceless encoda and the lower 2% of voiced encoda. And what you can see is the location of the harmony maximum actually differs across these two inputs. So the output for the voiced form, whoa, the text kind of went crazy here, sorry about that. The uh, output for the voiced input <coughs> deviates towards the underlying form. So it's moved down on the y-axis, lowering the activation of voiceless, and it's moved over on the x-axis, increasing the activation of voiced. So this blended phonological representation that has elements of both voiceless and voiced encoda is then passed to the phonetics, realizing this intermediate uh, phonetic representation that we see in uh, German and other languages. As Paul briefly mentioned, this grammatical formalism can be extended beyond simple examples like this, and we're happy to talk about all sorts of the wonderful applications that we've been looking at. So today what um, Pyongyang and I have been trying to do is integrate um, uh, dynamic continuous computation with discrete symbolic knowledge. So in this framework, the representations are distributed abstract patterns of activation in a linguistically structured space. Processing is spreading activation, sensitive to constraints on linguistic structure, incorporating combinatorial attractors that reflect the generative structure of linguistic representations. We um, showed how this predicts blends of multiple symbol structures in early stages of computation. Coactivation and perception being the empirical data showing this. It predicts weak blends of multiple structures in the output of computation. And incomplete neutralization is the empirical data used to support this. We're currently looking at what are the additional computational consequences of these blend states. Yesterday, uh, Anna Mai, Eric Bakovich, and I had a poster looking at opaque process interactions in phonology. You can find Eric at the back of the room if you want some reprints of that poster. And once again, we'll plug Pyong Wen's talk on Sunday in the CMCL meeting, which looks at incremental sentence processing. Can do one more? OK. So the fundamental observations we started with is that cognition requires the computational properties of discrete combinatorial representations, <coughs> but the neurobiological substrate is largely continuous. So the cognitive system has both continuous and discrete computational properties. We did this by building on the integrated connectionist symbolic architecture that Paul and uh, colleagues such as Shirley and Legendre have developed, where discrete representations and structured symbolic knowledge are mapped to vector-based representations and computations. Gradient symbolic computation then unifies this with the dynamics of connectionist computation in order to create the possibility for computations over blends of symbols. Thanks so much for your attention, and again, the NSF for funding all of this work.